LA. He flew in. He flew in yesterday, last night, pretty late last night, and uh, and uh, we're super excited uh, that he's that he's here. If you've not read about him, he is uh, absolutely a re he's a real pro, and um, I know we're all going to learn a lot. He did say that it would mu be much much better if you folks in the back would just come down front. Just come down so he can speak in a more intimate way rather than to this, you know, gigantic room. It looks much less crowded when you're all spread out. So yeah, come on down. Meet each other. <laughs> all right. Good, all right, well let's give a warm welcome to, uh, to Tommy Iga. Last night for about five minutes before I went to bed. 
and uh, I have not at all shredded on it. I have not played it really at all, and that's by design. Because every time I go to a clinic, I am introducing myself to this brand new instrument that I've never played before. And the idea is not for me to come out and play perfectly, it's to come out here and make music. Now, music is what drives me. I hate drumming. Hate it. Can't stand I hate drumming so much, but I love music. This is a vehicle for me to make music. That's what I am. A musician who happens to play the drums. I can't talk about drumming because it doesn't mean anything to me. But I can talk about drumming inside of musical situations forever. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Are you guys down? Yeah. All right. So here we go. I'm going to try to warm up a little bit. I'll play a tune. I'll play a track. Um, I can play this track. I did this thing on Drumeo recently. It was a thing called New Ground. I don't know if anybody's heard it. Anybody know that tune, New Ground? Yeah. You guys want to see that one? See if I can get through that one? See if I'll play it live right in front of you. Some people are like, I don't believe you played that one take. Well, either you won't believe it or we'll believe it today. I don't know, depending on whether or not I can uh, pull it off. It's a great piece of music. It's built on a Caribbean rhythm with a, um, an African song called Bridge. And uh, let's see what happens and then we'll take it from there. Okay, here we go.
think I'm sufficiently warmed up. You guys all heard that track? Did you hear it good? Yeah. Yeah, those are some of the best players in the world. It's James Tinas on the bass and Darwin Meter from the New York Voices on sax. And Dave Pekoski from Roy Haynes Band on piano. I never get tired of playing that track because their genius comes through all the time. Uh, whew. So let's start off, uh, let's start off easy. Okay, let's start off easy. Who has a question? We can start off right there, the bold guy. We had a talk today about... Stand up. We had a talk today about traditional grip versus mat grip. Yeah, I, I saw that on the itinerary. What's How did that go? It was cool. What, what was cool about it? Everyone had nice things to say about both kind of. <laughs> so, so everybody had nice things to say about both grips. <laughs> So both grips were respected. Yeah, two good in their own right. How old are you? Nineteen. Nineteen. This is why I'm so glad we're having this discussion. Now tell me what you walked out of that meeting. What did you walk out of? What was your takeaway? Well, Summary sentence. One sentence. Go. I had my mind up made before the talk, but I... There's more than one sentence. One sentence. <laughs> so what I'm doing with this gentleman right now is what I do in my teaching. So what I'm going to do with you today, stand right there, you're doing great, by the way, okay? Stand right there. This is the first one, by the way, you get a pair of sticks at the end of the show. Uh, um, you can have these, because they're preconditioned. <laughs> they don't have any legs left in them, but <laughs> you got it, New York's. Um, uh, you can stand. So the reason I'm asking, so I do a thing with my students, uh, which is what I do with myself. And I walk the walk. I don't do anything, I don't ask anything of my students, I don't do myself. And one of the things I do is uh, uh, I say, give me your summary sentence. So if we talk about anything, and you'd be able to talk about the concept that we were, we were just discussing in one sentence. I do this with my kids at dinner. What's Star Wars about? One sentence, go. <laughs> that you'd be able to cut through the clutter, the static. And this is an exercise that I recommend everyone try to do. Now, one of the, if you can't think, say, think, think of your favorite movie, okay? Uh, Deadpool, okay? One of my favorites. Um, and you have to say it in one sentence, okay? And it's hard, really, really hard to say one sentence. Go to Guy, if you have, like, take your cable TV, go to Guy, they do it for you. That's how you do it. That's how you get it. So I have my kids around it. Now they're like masters of one sentence. So we talk about like political stuff, we talk about whatever it is that we're happy to be talking about. Give me your summary sentence. What is your, where is your summary sentence? So now, you, my brother of 19 years old, summary sentence. And don't say you had your mind made up beforehand because you're too young for that, so go. I now understand why traditional grip is used. Now that, Excellent summary sentence. I had a better understanding. That is an well, excellent summary. Give this guy a hand. <laughs> now that is an excellent summary sentence. I now have. Now you're, you're a match good player. Yes, sir. Okay. It was just great. And, uh, but he just said, wow, what a great summary sentence. He went into a conference, a round table, hearing people talk, a uh, whole thing of banter about traditional versus match. And you came out with an understanding of why traditional is used. Could you, could you have a better outcome? No, you can't. Because 19 years old, you're going to go through your life, and now you have that seed planted in your head for that. So, mm, beautiful. That's an excellent, excellent job. Now, what was your question to me? <laughs> what, what did you say about traditional? I don't, I never get into this argument or debate. Ever. Ever. I was, uh, I was, uh, I, I'll, and uh, listen, I love that people do. I think it's great. It's been going on. And listen, it'll never stop. It'll never end. Drummers are, I love drummers. And I hate drummers. I love them. That's like, it, there's, listen, that's love. There's no such thing as like love. You're like, listen, you know when you're in love when you want to murder someone, okay? And that's the same thing. It's like, you're like, that's why they will be feel something. Drummers do that for me. But I see people just like, they go to the, they go to the mat for a grip. And I'm like, no one cares but us. No one cares but other drummers, how you hold your sticks. Why do you play music for other drummers? You could have a stick out of your nostril 
And it won't matter if you're, if you're slammed, if you're smoking. No one cares. Only drummers care. So you are never going to be on a gig. You play kit? That's an honest, that's an honest answer. Really. Well, okay, so let's just make a take you're on a gig. You've got some other social players and you're playing that at the uh, piece of joint making 50 bucks, okay? And you're playing a gig, you're playing a gig, you're playing a groove, and you are playing traditional group. And you suck. And you're sucking, and it's terrible. The bass player is never going to look at you and say, God, you know, your groove sucks and I hate playing with you, but boy, do I love your traditional group. <laughs> it's never going to happen. So if you can say, you've got to say this way, or if you can say this way, I listen to music like this. So, so whatever you're going to say. So the reason, if you want to know my real opinion of is that they, they, what's the basic difference between that? You should know this. Who, uh, who else was at that round table today? Anybody else want to answer a question? Okay, you look at the glasses, you look smart. Huh? <laughs> Alright, okay. What's the basic difference between traditional and match? What's actually, this is really the only difference that matters. Uh, Summary sentence. Historically. No, no, no. This has nothing to do with history. The uh, basic physical difference between traditional and match will attend. Go. I'm saying, do I have to say it's kind of shape? Uh, no, you have to say it. You have to, oh. to articulate it. Okay, so. Stop. So anything that starts with so is going to be too long. And what's the difference, though? The physical difference between the, this and this? The start of the stroke comes from almost from different points of the game. Okay. Thank you very much. No, but that's right. That's excellent. But that's an excellent phrase. Anyone who stands up, you can try. That's right. That's right. Anyone who stands up and, and, and offers their energy to the group gets applause. Do. Come on. What? Not yet. Not yet.
Doesn't this make more sense if you need to play abusively loud that, that you're going to be benefiting from the weight of the hand over the stick? Doesn't that make sense? I can explain that to my daughter who doesn't play drums at all and she will be like, oh my god, that makes total sense. I would want to play like this. That's the difference. Don't worry about the fingers. Don't worry about this. The weight of the hand. I'm talking about German concert snare drum group, not French. This is Germany, this is France, this is American. It should be Switzerland because it's in between France and Germany. But it's not. We stole it. We called it American, which is in between France and Germany. But this is France, timpani grip. This is German concert snare drum grip. When I play, I play in a German slash American position. I very rarely play in a timpani grip French position on snare drum. Okay? When I want to play with that kind of dexterity, I'll go like this, because the stick is floating over my fulcrum. All right? Now, the beautiful thing about traditional grip is that it's matured from the military snare drum, which I'm sure you guys talked about today. It flattened out, and it became part of the vocabulary of this instrument, and it developed all these beautiful little things, like all this stuff. All these finger control things that you can do over the top of the stick. That's why it works, because your hand is under the stick and you can float over the top of it. Okay? So there's your summary sentence, mash and traditional. When you go home and you play both grips, notice the weight of your hand and how it influences this piece of wood. There's your summary sentence for traditional versus mash. Okay? Everybody got it? Good. Okay. Okay, anything else? Good. Oh, you go first, yeah. How do you utilize your kick and your fills? How do I utilize my kick and my fills? Hopefully well. And, uh, but uh, that's why I don't play double pedal uh, a lot. I don't hear the patient as a voice that's sustained. I don't, I don't hear it. I don't, I, don't, I don't play that way. I don't hear it that way. The, vo the basic voice for me inside of grooves is architecture. And inside of fills or solos is a voice. But it doesn't, I don't stay on that voice very, very long. You know? uh, so I utilize it in a way that I think most guys utilize it, uh, which is um, uh, uh, either as a hand replacement. So for example, if you're going to play, uh, uh, let's play a pair of little diddle, okay? You know, and everybody in this family, you know, let me tell you something, guys. Listen to me. 
Listen to me, and guys, I mean, uh, guys, gals, everything, that's a catch-all phrase with me, just, I'm loose, I hope nobody gets offended, okay? Listen to me, there's not a clarinet day going on down the street. There's not a flute day going on down the street. There's not. There just isn't. This is, I'm telling you, we are, more than any other instrument, we're like pack animals. We look, we're like a little, like, and we gather together, and we play, and we tricky things, we're like little, like little bulls or something, I don't know. But anyway, and excuse my, uh, I'm sorry, I'm like dying, my allergies are like on, like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, forgive me, okay guys, it's like, it's, I'm like, I took, I took about 10 snorts of Afrin before I got up here. I was like, you know, I was like, and people were like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know, man, I can't stop, you know? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, is it, is it nasal cord? Is that better? Really? Okay, so we're talking about no, no sprays, guys. I told you, I told you we're gonna talk about what you wanna talk about. <laughs> Thank you, I'll try nasal cord. I just went into 7-Eleven and got a, an Afrin. Okay, it looks like uh, something that goes in your nose, I'll try it. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not like, it's been like, I've been in California now, so I was like, I was like, kind of sniffly, right? And then I got off the plane here and I was just like, boom. <laughs> oh man, alright. So anyway, forgive me for my uh, sniffles, I apologize. Um, uh, so, uh, did anybody answer that question? Uh, no, okay, here's the question, who's gonna answer for me? Why do we practice technique? Summary sentence answer, don't be cowards. Somebody stand up and answer it. Come on, come on, come on. Look at this, double energy from this young lady, go. That's actually a very good answer. We're gonna put it in the bullpen over here, stick a pin in it, it's right. Not the one I'm looking for right now, but it's right, it's right. But if I had a summary sentence, a summary sentence, she's right, she's not right. right. But I'm, that, I'm looking for the, the it's, you know the golden rule? Golden rule, right? We all live by the golden rule. Do unto others, right? And all the other, all the other stuff is, you know, all the other stuff you learn is up here, and everything can be distilled down to the golden rule. <laughs> that's really it, all right? That's how you live your life. Do unto others, right? So I'm looking for the the, the, the distillation of why we practice technique. That's why we practice technique to listen to others. Oh, oh, I said, so, so your mind is not on the CPU, is not on the thing. That's actually very good. We're going to put that over here. That's another right answer, but not the gold rule. So what is that? Go. To make everything you play easier. Yeah. 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 To make everything you play easier. Boy, we're really, really close. We're really, really close. We're really, really close. Okay, here's the answer. All right, you want to go? Okay, last one. What? Did you write all the these are right, all, all right answers. Big, 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 big. Right there. All A plus answers, okay? But the golden rule of why, why we practice technique is for one thing and one thing only. And this is the umbrella thing that applies to all things, all things, and all bands and all music. You practice technique so you don't ever have to think about technique. That's why you practice technique. Why does this piano player sit do five octaves up and down in tenths? Every day, all one, and they will do it every day. So when they get to it in a piece of Rachmaninoff, they will never have to think about technique. When you're performing, when I'm sitting here performing, the last thing I want to ever think about is technique. When you think about technique, what is that? Fear. That's fear. If you're thinking about technique, that's you being worried you can't execute, perform, and deliver. That's why you practice technique. So you never have to think about technique. Everything else that you guys said was 100% right and goes right in that. So my thing is the distillation of all your things. Okay? Right? Okay, my question Go ahead, sir. What is the process that you have to go through in order to be a musician on Broadway? What's the process you have to go through to be a musician on Broadway? Um, you know, Broadway's changed a lot in the uh, last, this was the last 20 years. Um, uh, Broadway used to be the bastion of musicians who were not good enough to play in the studios. Okay? 
the studio work was where the highest paid stuff was. And that's where, you know, uh, uh, all the greatest players played in, in studios, right? And Broadway was always a really good job. It was always very steady. Didn't pay as well as studio stuff, but it was a great, it was a good game, really good game. But it was never considered where the great players go. You didn't see Steve Gadd playing a Broadway show. You didn't see Broadway Howard, you know, you didn't see that, okay? But then everything changed in the 90s when the studio business was destroyed by technology, Pro Tools, digital editing. And all of a sudden, drummers weren't even needed. They could be replaced. And all of a sudden, that work was gone. So those players migrated to the Broadway pits. So now Broadway is where the best players in New York are killing themselves to get those gigs. So it's a very competitive world there now. And I'm just telling you the truth. All right? Now, the process is, uh, are you interested in something like this, by the way? Yeah. You must be, you asked the question. How old are you? 18. What the hell's wrong with you? Why aren't you there playing a Broadway show right now? One kid. <laughs> but at 18, um, I played my first Broadway show at 20. Okay? So are you going, are you studying, in, are you high school? No, I got, okay, thank God. Jesus, I was like, going to give you really bad advice if you were still in high school, okay? But you're in college, okay? So if you're thinking about going to New York or somewhere, you know, New York is where the Broadway scene is. There's other places, but it's uh, where the Broadway scene is really the, you know, that in London. With the music theater stuff is the strongest. So it would work out. So I'm going to use you as an example. What's your name? Mason? Yeah. Okay, Mason. All right. You ready? You ready to hear Mason's journey? You guys ready? Yeah. Come on, energy! Yeah. You're sitting like bumps on a log. This isn't flute day. Okay? Give, 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 and I give. So here we go. Mason, he turns 20 years old. He says, I'm going for it. I'm moving to New York. And he shows up, and no one cares. Except his mom and dad who are here. But Mason's there. And now he's in New York, but you know what? He's smart. He has a couple of friends. He says, you know what? Can I crash at your place? And he, he said, oh, man, it's great. We've got, a, a four, uh, uh, we got a, another broom closet that we can put a mattress in. Great. Perfect. That's great. And you eat SpaghettiOs, and you sleep in a, on a cot in the broom closet, right? That's perfect. That's perfect things. And you go there, and you network, and you meet people, and you try to get gigs, and you sit in, and you go to jam sessions, and this will last years. And you make a name for yourself, and you try to get known. You got to people talking about you. Mason is going to New York to network because the music business is about people, not music. The music business is about people, not you. Now, that's of course assuming that you're a great player. Okay, but there's a lot of great players who can't get gigs because they suck at people. All right, you have to be have to be a good person. You have to like you know not be a jerk. Basically, you can be sarcastic, you can be funny. That's not being a jerk. Being a jerk is being a jerk. You know, not being not being respectful. You know, not uh, you know lying. You know, being you know trying to uh, uh, you know screw somebody else out of a gig. That happens all the time. And once you get a mark like that, it's very hard to get it off. But let's make pretend that's not you. You're the great kid Mason, and you're going up, and you're down there, and you're networking, and you finally meet a guy who's a plays guitar, and he is a sub on a Broadway show. And he's maybe 22 years old. Close enough. But he's just more than two, and he's working his butt off, and he is now subbing on a Broadway show. And he just said, hey man, the guy I heard, just he's looking for another uh, sub. And he recommends you. That's how it works. Now let's assume that you get that recommendation. You go in, you respectfully, you have a nice young man, you go and just meet this older drummer, doesn't know who the heck you are. He goes in and he says, okay, um, have you ever done Broadway before? You say no, but I am going to study you and I have done musical theater before, I know how to follow a conductor and I will memorize this show in and out and I will not make you sorry. And you convince him. Mason gets his shot. It's three months out, and it's a big target on it, on your calendar, the bullseye. And you go, and you don't suck. <laughs> you don't hit it out of the park. No one does the first time. 
but you did well enough to get invited back. You take the conductor's notes, you are a professional, you come and watch the other drummer play it again, which is something that nobody does, and if you're my student, I'm gonna yeah, give you all these things to do, to how you, you, you make it look and seen and hear, like you are not only dotting the eyes and crossing the T's, you're circling them and putting happy faces and unicorns on them. And you go back and you do it again. And this time you hit a grand slam. Before you know it, your phone is ringing from another drummer on Broadway who needs a sum. Now you've got two shows, then three. Before you know it, you're turning down work because every drummer on Broadway needs great subs. And in about 10 years, you get a call for your own show. It's a 10-year process. You're welcome. That's how it's done. Okay? <laughs> stories on Broadway or something like that where there's com competition. So listen, uh, you know, I, by the way, I got to hear some of the, some of the professionals last night and they were, uh, what I was saying, you guys said, absolutely, just, a, can we give all each other a round of applause for the great performance of the really, really nice. Music is competitive. It's a competitive industry and anyone tells you it's not, so we're, it's a, we're in a university and I, um, uh, I'm not a university guy. I, co I teach at universities all around the world and I love great learning institutions. I'm a huge, huge proponent and a big advocate of great educators. Uh, but the thing is that they bring, they bring me in to keep everybody real. Like, this isn't real, you know? This is family. When you go out, nobody cares. You have to win. You have to be better. If you want a gig on this instrument and you're going against someone, it's competition. You can shake hands and say, oh, that's great all you want, but at the end of the day, you want the gig, and he wants the gig, and you, someone's going to win. And that's the way it is. And there's no reason to sugarcoat that. Competition is everywhere. This is the way it is. And the music business is absolutely no different. It doesn't mean that we're not artists first. We can be. But once we start making this about business, which it is, you have to have a healthy sense of competition. And the Broadway thing is an excellent example of that. So thank you for that question. Very good. OK, anything else? Good, sir. How much do you study work with non-drummers, and how do you incorporate that in your own Bam! Right there. That kid, boom. Give him a round of applause for that. Kid. I only study the work of non-drummers. I only study the work of non-musicians. Now, I studied all my heroes. I'm still fascinated by great young talent when I see it. And I mean the rare stuff, like Jacob Collier. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, yeah, I know. As the kid's just like, he's like Beethoven reincarnated or something. It's like, you know, it's just, it's, yeah, it's not, I can't even. Did you see that video of him where he was talking backstage to somebody and he went, he was like, yeah, yeah, it's like a, uh, you know, extra picture lady went, boom, right? And it, was, and it was spot on. It was on a keyboard in sight. But there was a guy playing keyboard on the other screen, and he was playing, and he was, his pitch was so perfect, it was like he was nailing all these, like, it, it was, I just wanted to punch the screen. It was like so much talent. It was like, how much talent can one person have? Uh, at any rate, uh, so like that. So I study uh, 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 almost all non-musicians. Uh, and, uh, you know, for work ethic, uh, overcoming obstacles. Uh, mindset, I'm a huge, huge, huge guy about mindset. Uh, if, we took, if you take lessons with me, uh, at least 50% of the time is going to be discussing mindset. Because usually people sit down behind this instrument and they are guaranteed to suck. Because their mindset is holding them back. You have to, so in my studio we have a mindset of, it's called ARF. It'll be the first thing we discuss when we come in. A or F. There is no B, there is no C, there's no D. It's A or F. Because if you have those grades in your vocabulary, you will level down to them. So you only have one place to go, A. And it's okay if it's an F today. It's gonna be an A tomorrow. And every day we're working for an A. So B, C, D, they don't exist. 
And when I suck people out of that mediocre mindset and I bring them to mine, there's no, there's no ceiling. There's no ceiling. You can go as high as you want. So I take handcuffs off. That's what I try to, try to do inside now. Um, and uh, so that's what I do mostly. I study non musicians. Okay. All right. Anything else? Oh, young man in the red. Oh no no. When I was in uh, like in high school and stuff. Oh yeah, when I was in high school, I did uh, uh, all melodic percussion and timpani, and I love that stuff. Um, and then well, I was always uh, uh, two instruments always called to me. And that was uh, drums and piano. Those were my instruments. And um, you know, I just I still take piano lessons now. You know, and I'm not a pianist by any point, but I love playing piano. And I love getting my butt kicked. And I got this guy. I used to take lessons with this old Italian guy who was a accordion player and a piano. And he says piano and accordion. And I don't know if you know accordion players, but they are intense. And they're usually spectacular musicians. The guys who can shred on accordion, it's no joke. We're not talking about beer by polka here. We're talking about like, like virtuosos, right? And this guy, he used to sit next to me with a ruler. I think you can tell where this is going, right? All right? And he would never, he would never hurt me or anything like that. But boy, he would smack right next to my fingers and like, and it was like, <laughs> he would curse at me in Italian, which I loved. Because I didn't know what the hell he was talking about, but I knew he wasn't happy. I thought he wasn't happy. And that, that old school thing, it's like, and, you know, the passion he showed in his lessons, you know, he didn't get any more money for being that way. I don't get any more money for being this way. You know, you come and study with me, I am all in. I don't know any other way to be. Especially when we're talking about my love and passion, which is this. I can't do this slouched. I can't do this halfway. I can only do this like this. I lean in and I am engaged. And I scare people, and I know that. And I used to be, wow, scaring people. And now I'm like, good. <laughs> because you should be, if this scares you. Because come to me. Don't make me come down to you. Come to me. I told you the discussion last night, we had a seat. So here's the thing about like when I get guys and come, they take a lesson and they sit behind the drum set. And I'm like, and I watch them play. And I say, are you comfortable? Are you comfortable behind the drum set? And they go, yeah. And I'm like, well, you're gonna, you're gonna stop always because you're comfortable. I don't want to be comfortable on my drum seat. I don't want a cushy drum seat. I don't want a bicycle seat. I don't want it soft. And big and puffy. I want it firm. I want it just barely enough to hold my butt because I am getting work done. I sit on the front of the seat. I'm not trying to be comfortable. I'm getting work done. That's the mindset of what I'm talking about. And once people hear that, they're like, okay, <laughs> crazy person, you know? But then, you know, then, like five minutes later, when I get them to sit on the front part of their seat and I change it off and, it's, and I say it's something really hard and firm. They're like, they play, they're like, wow, I feel alive back here. I feel alive. What does a drummer do in a band? What does a drummer do? Young man, stand up and answer me. Louder. Hold the rest of the band together. Do that kid. that makes all things possible in every band that you see this stupid, crazy instrument in. This instrument is called a contraption. That's why it's called a trap set. That's why it was originally called a trap set, because it was a contraption. It had temple blocks and, and horns and whistles and all sorts of gongs. And it used to be played in silent movie houses with a piano player with Charlie Chaplin on his screen. And it was that contraption and a piano player, and that was the sound. The contraption, this thing, used to be a 30-inch bass drum. It had no hi-hat. What was the hi-hat originally called when, it, when somebody wanted to make something with their left foot? What was, the, what was that thing called with their left foot? Go. Oh, boy. No. Sock hat. No. <laughs> it was called.
called a snowshoe. It was two pieces of wood with tacks, and you would fit the tacks together. That was called a snowshoe. That became the? The low boy. The low boy, which was down about this high. And then miraculously, somebody came up with a spring, a tube, and a hi-hat was born. That's the, that's the evolution of this instrument. This 30-inch military bass drum went down in size to a, a tiny little 26. Now it's a 22, and this is gargantuan to a lot of people. The drum set evolved. This is what this is. So when we play in a, when we play this thing in a band, we are the engine that makes things go. Now, if you want to be this kind of engine. that engine? No. So what's the difference between this? There's two groups. Two, two groups. I don't worry about that. Two groups. And this. Now we get that obviously one is loud. We know that. But that's like, you know, a five-year-old could tell me that. What's the difference between those two groups? I'll see if you get it right. Okay, go. Uh, I don't want a new person, new person, no, new person. Come on, we got the same energy from the same people, and I see this, I see this from the guys who are too cool. Here's the, here's the look of, this is the look of people who are too cool. Boy, this guy from the Yorkshire talks a lot. All right, go. What? The energy. That's the easiest thing. Do you see? I sat like this, and I put the tips of my sticks, and I made this thin little garbage sound, like a little mouse. And then I sat forward, and I got full depth out of each instrument. There's not a bass player in the world who will not respond to that. Now, whether or not I play soft or loud, I still can play with the same energy. And that's why great players can play that energy at double piano, okay? So that's a different discussion. It takes a long time to get into that, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, uh, we are, uh, hey Rick, look at the time. Five more minutes, holy crap. Um, that's not gonna work. Uh, all right, I'll tell you what. You guys wanna see a technique thing? We're doing a lot of technique. You wanna do a technique thing? Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah. All right, yeah. I'll do it down there, right? Is that you guys cool with that? Yeah. All right, all right. We only have five minutes. Rick, I might need ten. Alright? Am I gonna get am I gonna get in trouble? You sure? Yeah. Hey, can I get a big hand from Rick, please? Yeah. Yeah. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. I do this all over the world. I do this all over the world. This is a really good day of percussion. You guys are awesome. Everybody, this energy is great, and it comes from Rick. Okay? I am not an easy guy to track down. Believe me, Rick can tell stories. You know, he was very patient. I'm not any, I only do one, I think this is probably going to be the only day of percussion I do this year. Okay? Uh, he tracked me down, and listen, the energy of a day of percussion, the turnout, everything about it, the quality of the ensembles, and also, how about all the other great instructors who are here today? We have a So that energy, that energy that we have in this room, that is due to, it always comes from the top, and if I have a bump on a log who's doing a day percussion like this, that's what it's like in the room. But it's not like that today, so thank you Rick for being awesome, you're amazing, thank you. All right. Now